The existence of Bigfoot is not yet a verified fact, simply because he has not been captured dead or alive. There is, however, much circumstantial evidence in the form of hundreds of eyewitnesses, footprints, hair samples, and, less conclusive, a few fuzzy or disputed photographs. You may have heard or read about many sightings of the elusive hairy biped, but the lesser known are the close encounters of the third kind, contact, or even the fourth kind, abduction. Yes, people have reported physical attacks by Bigfoot and even abductions. Today in the video, we'll talk about how the hero managed to survive a Bigfoot attack. Click the like button and subscribe right now. Welcome to Wild Assault. The Adventures of the Most Famous World Famous Bigfoot Captive, Albert Ostman. He was already over 80 when the whole world learned about his Bigfoot abduction. They wrote about him in books, newspapers, and magazines interviewed him. Albert had not told anyone about the incident for more than 30 years, rightly believing that his story could only provoke ridicule and suspicion of mental illness. And yet, on the slope of years, he decided to do it and did the right thing. Because to take with him to the grave such a sensation, he simply had no right. In 1924, after a hard day's work, Albert decided to spend his vacation in a quiet, secluded place in nature, and at the same time to fish, hunt, and if he was lucky, to wash gold because in the area where he was going, there were old abandoned mines. Albert chose a rather wild spot near the extreme point of Toba Bay, British Columbia, Canada, for its beautiful nature and secluded location. It offers magnificent ocean views, picturesque sunsets, and a variety of marine life including whales, sea lions, and dolphins. The area also attracts outdoor enthusiasts as it offers kayaking, windsurfing, fishing, and other water sports. Just across the median of Vancouver Island, the elderly Indian who was ferrying him in his boat across the bay informed Albert that he had picked a bad spot where a man had recently gone missing. After hesitating a moment, he added, I think Bigfoot killed him. This was the first time Albert had heard of Bigfoot, so he insisted that the Indian tell him about him. When he heard what he was talking about, Albert smiled and said that such monkeys were only found in Russia, and that all rumors about Bigfoot were just local legends. The Indian shook his head and said nothing. Having agreed with him that he would pick him up in two weeks, Albert went to look for a place to camp. He set up under the crown of a large oak tree with a stream babbling nearby. He hung his raincoat and warm sweater on the branches. In the first days, he managed to shoot a deer, cooked the meat over the fire in a cauldron, enjoyed the serene peace and beautiful weather. Six days passed like that, but on the seventh day, when Albert woke up in the morning, he got out of his sleeping bag, stretched out, and reached for his pants, which he had hung on a branch before going to bed, but they were not there. The pants were lying on the ground, crumpled by someone, and the tin cans, which had stood in a regular pyramid the evening before, were scattered. Albert figured it was a porcupine that had made a mess. It was all right, but his thick leather boots were still intact, for the porcupine could easily have eaten them. The next night, Albert stuffed his boots in the bottom of the sleeping bag, collected canned food in a rucksack, and hung it on a branch of an oak tree, and under the edge of the sleeping bag, just in case he put a loaded rifle. In the morning, he found the backpack turned inside out on the branch, all its contents lying under the tree. Most importantly, the deer carcass he had stored in cold water had disappeared from the creek. Clearly, it wasn't a porcupine that had been in his camp. Then what was it? A bear? But that animal could have done more damage than that. Albert looked for footprints, but found only indentations in the sand that looked like moccasin prints. Albert had a thought that the old Indian who had carried him in the boat was trying to scare him, but he dismissed it at once. He gathered all the supplies in his knapsack. Everything was intact except that someone had hollowed out a bag of prunes. The night before, Albert decided to track down the mysterious visitor at all costs. It was getting dark, the weather had turned bad, and clouds covered the sky. Fearing that the crown of the oak tree would not protect his belongings from the rain, Albert stuffed not only his boots, but also his rucksack with supplies, as well as his rifle and knife, into his sleeping bag. To be ready for the night, he did not undress and squeezed into the sleeping bag in his jacket and pants. When the first raindrop fell on his forehead, he tightened the straps of the bag and pulled the flap over his face, leaving only his nose outside. 
Alas, Albert did not suffer from insomnia, and his intention to stalk the intruder remained an intention. As soon as he closed his eyes, he fell into a deep sleep. In the morning, he awoke to a cold wind blowing through his sleeping bag. When he looked outside, he saw that his fire was out. His backpack and gun were lying nearby, and his boots were no longer on his feet, but near the fire where they were being dried. Albert realized that no one had visited his camp during the night, but he himself was alert enough to keep out unwanted guests. In the morning, he cleaned up the camp, checking every nook and cranny to make sure nothing was missing. He gathered all of his belongings, stacked them neatly in his backpack, checked the rest of his food supplies, and made sure they were in order. Albert also looked around his camp to make sure there were no clues left from the evil encroachment. He took his fishing rod, bait, and some snacks with him. The weather was beautiful and he enjoyed the peace and quiet. With each cast of the rod he relaxed more and more, forgetting all his worries and problems. Finally, as the sun began to sink, Albert caught his first fish. Emotions overwhelmed him and he felt like a real winner. While the fish was roasting on the fire, he settled down on the grass and enjoyed the delicious lunch he had prepared himself. After the sun had set over the horizon, Albert resolutely returned to his camp. He built a fire to keep warm and settled into his sleeping bag. The night was quiet and peaceful without adventure or trouble. After preparing breakfast and wrapping it in a sack to take with him on his long walk, Albert set out to look for signs of the mysterious trespass. He walked around the neighborhood, examining every patch of ground, every tree, looking for any clues. Albert spent the next few days gathering firewood for a residence. He walked around the neighborhood, looking for dry branches and wood that could serve as fuel for his fire. He examined every tree, every shrub, to find suitable materials to build a fire. Albert used his knife to saw larger branches into manageable pieces that were easier to carry. He also gathered dry leaves and grass to use as bedding for the fire and to build a flame. The next day, Albert decided to go for a long walk in the neighborhood. He took with him a backpack with provisions and water, a shotgun in case of dangerous situations, and of course, his trusty knife. Albert explored forest trails and mountain peaks. He enjoyed the natural beauty and tranquility that reigned around him. He also managed to shoot some game for dinner and he cooked himself a delicious roast on the fire. He returned to camp and went to bed. Waking up was quite unusual. He was no longer lying in his sleeping bag, but hanging and as if driving. He was being shaken every now and then. His rifle, tin cans were digging into his body with their sharp parts. He was hanging in absolute darkness, literally clenched by his bag and the junk that filled it. There was a thought of cutting a hole in the sleeping bag with a knife, but he couldn't move an arm or a leg. The sleeping bag with Albert was dragged by someone big and very strong. His sniffing and grunting came to the helpless man every now and then. Had he been kidnapped by that huge, wild, hairy man of whom the Indian had spoken? This was a question Albert asked himself more than once as he felt the creature being lifted upward with its heavy burden. The most annoying thing was that he was armed but could use neither gun nor knife. The creepiest feeling he had was when Albert felt that the sleeping bag with him was hanging over some void and he was going down as if on an elevator. Finally, the sleeping bag hit the ground. The train seemed to have arrived at the final station. His body was completely stiff. It was hard to even move. He poked his head out of the bag, took a convulsive gulp of fresh air. It was still dark and he could hear some inarticulate mumbling. As dawn broke, he climbed out of the sack clutching his rifle and saw the vague silhouettes of four huge bipedal creatures flanking him on all sides. Guys, what the hell do you want me for? He said the first thing that came to mind. Some mumbling came in response. For now, he was unmoved and Albert eyed the creatures that stood beside him. They were clearly a family of wild men. They were all covered in hair, were unclothed and resembled huge apes. No doubt he had been dragged here by his master, an adult male between 7 and 8 feet tall, 213 to 244 centimeters. Albert nicknamed him Old Man. His old lady, an adult female with saggy, furry chest pouches, was clearly displeased that her husband had brought a two-legged beastie into the house. The couple's children, a young female and a male, were clearly frightened by the sight of the man. As it seemed to Albert, the old man gesticulating and muttering something told the others how he had obtained this foreign wonder. When the sun rose, the hairy creatures left, leaving Albert alone. 
He looked around. There were sheer cliffs all around. Only in one place there was a small V-shaped passage that led somewhere upward. There must have been a stream in the dense thicket below. He ventured down and did indeed see water and a young female who was leaning into the stream, drinking like an animal. Albert chose a spot, dragged the rest of his belongings, prunes, macaroni, a box of rifle cartridges and matches were gone, and began to think how to get out of this mess. He still had matches in his jacket pocket in a waterproof box. Canned food could be stretched for several days. Longer than that, he could not stay here. For two days, the Yetis hadn't bothered him. They seemed to be watching him and all his actions from afar. He was a one-man theater, and they were his spectators. Of course, Albert had no intention of staying with them, but as soon as he came to the passage in the rocks, the old man appeared as if from the ground. The Yeti was waving his arms and mumbling threateningly something like, Saga, Soka. One could try to shoot him, of course, but any one of the other Yetis could blow his head off with a single blow of his hand. We had to wait for the right moment. When Albert returned from the creek, he found a guest beside his sleeping bag. The son of the master had come to visit him. He didn't touch anything, but he looked at things with avid curiosity. At Albert's appearance, he jumped, aside but did not hide, and remained standing watching the man. Albert lit a fire and brewed himself some coffee, the younger Yeti greedily sucking in the smell of it with his nostrils. I had to throw him an empty stew can. He caught it deftly, licked it, and left immediately. Soon he returned, but not alone, but with his sister. She sat down in the distance, and the boy repeatedly brought the empty can to his mouth, copying Albert's gestures as he sipped his coffee. Albert finished his coffee, took out a jar of snuff, took a pinch, and held it to his nose. The jar was almost empty, so he tossed it to the young female. When she realized, after some confusion, that it was a gift for her, she grabbed the brightly colored jar and let out a shrill, vibrating squeal. This unpleasant sound in no way resembled joyful laughter, but it seemed to be just that. On the day of the escape, the old man and his son were sitting next to Albert. Albert opened the last tin of snuff, took a pinch, brought it to his nose and inhaled with pleasure. The old Yeti watched his actions intently, then Albert held out the jar to him, thinking he would take a pinch too. But the old man grabbed the jar and immediately poured all its contents into his mouth and licked the jar. Albert waited in horror to see what would happen next. After a while, the master bulged his eyes, grabbed his stomach and started rolling on the ground. Albert jumped up, clutching his rifle. He thought the Yeti would swoop down on him. But the old man, holding his hand over his stomach and squealing shrilly, jumped up to the stream and began to drink greedily. Albert realized it was time to run. Grabbing his belongings, he rushed toward the passage in the rocks. An old woman, grinning, blocked his path, but he shot over her head and she disappeared. He climbed upward, panting, breaking all records of movement in the mountains. Suddenly, he heard a loud roar behind him. He looked back and saw that a young male Bigfoot was chasing him. He sped up his pace, but the Yeti was getting closer and closer. Albert fired a shot in the air to scare him, but it only made the creature angrier. The young Yeti was a huge and powerful creature, his fur ruffled, his fangs sharp as knives, and his eyes blazing with fire. When it caught up with Albert, it sank its teeth into his arm, tearing it with the force of a wild beast. Albert was in deafening pain, blood gushing from the wound, but he did not give up. He drew his gun and fired a precise shot into the Yeti's arm, forcing him to let go of his hand. The young Yeti squealed in pain so shrill that the sound pierced the air and echoed off the rocks. His eyes blazed brightly, and his fangs, snapping from Albert's hand, glinted like knives in the sunlight. The blood gushing from the wound on his arm was black in color, like the very essence of the dark depths. It formed strange patterns on the ground, splashing and flowing into a small stream. Bigfoot blood mingled with human blood, creating an eerie sight. At that moment, Albert decided to run, ignoring the gruesome, bloody pattern. He kept running and heard the loud roar of the Yeti behind him. The creature was wounded, but it was still full of rage and thirsty for revenge. Albert realized that he needed to get out of here as fast as possible to survive. He sped up his run, feeling the pain in his arm but not stopping. 
Soon he reached a passage in the rocks and ran into it without hesitation. Albert stopped, panting as he hid from the Yeti, realizing that his escape had cost him dearly. He wrapped a piece of cloth around his arm to stop the bleeding and pressed himself against the wall of rocks. Thus ended the day's escape from the Yeti. Albert realized that many more dangers awaited him, but he was ready to fight for his life to the end. The next day, Albert continued to move deeper into the cave despite his pain and exhaustion. He tried to stay on the side of open areas to avoid encounters with Bigfoot. His wound throbbed with pain, but he tried to ignore it. After a few hours of moving, Albert found a way into the cave to the surface. By evening, he climbed down the cliff, shot a grouse, and roasted its meat on the fire. In the morning, he woke up in a terrible state. He felt sick, his stomach ached, and he was dizzy. It was either the nervous tension or something wrong with the meat he had eaten. He staggered downhill until he heard the sound of an engine running. Soon he came to the logging camp. Only then did he realize that he had been saved after all.